You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach, and this is Five Things That Make Life Better. Norm Eisen is my guest this week. You've seen him on TV a bunch because he used to be the ethics czar under President Obama. So he's been very watchful of Trump from the very beginning. He is also a senior fellow at Brookings Institution. He was our ambassador to the Czech Republic. He's also a co-founder of the Voter Protection Program, which is bipartisan and a commentator on CNN. He was the counsel to the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee for Trump's first impeachment. So I really wanted to talk to him right after the second impeachment. He's an optimist and he did cheer me up and the lawsuits against Trump are starting to be filed. Now, as I write this, I've been trying to put myself in the shoes of Texans and other Americans who are dealing with the dramatic snowfall and loss of power, loss of energy, loss of clean water, loss of food. It's a real crisis. To us in the Northeast, snow, the kind that we have, is either fun or it's a nuisance. It can strangle us. I've lived through at least two snowpocalypses that shut down my life and other people's lives for days and days. But we did have heat and we did have electricity. So I haven't been in your cowboy boots exactly. To me, being cold is worse than being hot. I'm sending warm hugs and hoping you get power, hoping you get shoveled out, hoping the temperatures rise, hoping that the water mains are fixed, and I'm sending you virtual vats of hot soup. Here it is cold, but when the sun is out, which it has been, though it isn't now, I'm happier. I'm a sucker for the sun. It's warmth and it's promise. It improves everything and, of course, melts the snow and ice. I'm watching the gray creep into my hairline and feeling that I'm sort of stuck in amber. I know this is part of the COVID pandemic quarantine and a year or so, almost a year spent indoors, but still, that's how I feel. Where did the time go and what am I doing? To tell you the truth, the last 137 weeks have been purposeful and doing this podcast has been truly fun and at times exhilarating. When people who listen to it tell me they've enjoyed it, that they've tried something that was recommended or read a book by an author who they enjoyed listening to or felt they learned something they never knew about a guest, I feel good. It validates all the work and time that, believe it or not, go into this simple podcast. However, after 137 weeks, I'm thinking that with Joseph Biden in the White House, we can begin to wind it down. The podcast was really to hold hands during the siege of Donald Trump. This podcast is not a business. It doesn't throw off income, and I want to move on. It may be a book. It may be another podcast. As they say, watch this space. But until we do, we have several great guests coming up. And I want to say the end is near. It's not here. And today's guest, I'm telling you, Norm Eisen, you will enjoy. But first, here are my five things that make life better. Number one, very important, my Uniglow heat tech pants. Do you all know Uniqlo, the giant Japanese retailer? I think you do. If you don't, or if you're not aware of heat tech, they have patented some kind of textile innovation, which is called heat tech and has different strengths, I think. And it's something they put in their clothes and it makes you warmer. They put it in long underwear. They put it in socks, tights, jackets. And now I have a pair that I bought on sale of kind of dressy looking, wool looking trousers that probably aren't wool. They are pants and they hang beautifully. And there was just a day when I thought, I don't want to wear jeans again. I think I was going to a doctor and I wanted to impress them. Anyway, they are toasty. And when worn with long underwear, It's almost too much toast. Uniqlo. Fantastic. Number two, the paw furry dog throw. I noticed, well, Michael noticed that our dog was sort of chewing into what could have been a hole and then became a hole on our couch in the living room. So I started 
doing that very hard work of scrolling on Instagram for a product I thought I'd seen. Anyway, what I have bought is so fantastic. It comes from a company called Paw, and it is a very big, very thick, very waterproofed on the bottom, fake fur throw. And it says it goes with every decor. Our decor does not look like it would have fake or real fur anywhere in it. But no matter, we put it on the bed and the dog can lie there or play there without our worried about our bedspread. We can move it to the couch and no more nibbling at the upholstery. It's fantastic. I mean, I would become their spokesperson for just that. I don't know what else they make because that is one good product. Number three, the brisket sandwich at Orwasher's Bakery. Okay, this is very specific. It comes with a pickle and mustard, toasted or not. Either way, Orwasher's serves it on a sourdough bagel. It's $9. It's unbelievably good. Now, I have to say, some of you may know Orwasher's. It's a heritage bread bakery in New York. I didn't even know they made sandwiches. I didn't even know they made donuts. They make a lot of stuff and you can get it on DoorDash or Postmates. It's it's worth it. Number four, even though I'm not on Facebook, there's a page on Facebook that I am spending some time on. It's a private little group called I Grew Up in Old Manhattan, which is funny because Manhattan is so much older than any of us, but okay, whatever. And It is, I guess, for people who grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I am going down rabbit holes of, I would call it reminiscence porn, and I love every minute of it. I don't know the woman who started it, even though a lot of us who grew up here at that time do know one another, but obviously we know people in common and we're Facebook friends. Anyway, I think it's great. Lots of people are posting pictures of restaurants and candy stores and places that are long gone, and it's it's fun. Number five is the COVID industrial complex. I keep forgetting just how many people are engaged in trying to get us all vaccinated, tested, protected. It's not just the scientists. It's not just Dr. Fauci, whom I adore. It's the factory workers, the people who are shipping the vaccine and the and freezing them. And it's the administrators and the nurses and the doctors and the people who check your credentials when you're going to get your shot. And the people who guide you out so you're six feet apart from everyone else Yes, I had my first shot last week. I was never so happy to get a needle in my whole life. It didn't hurt. In fact, it was brilliant. And I thanked everyone there for smiling on a Saturday, giving people shots. It's really, it's really great. And now the optimistic, very smart Norm Eisen. Don't go away. Welcome back. It's Lisa Birnbach. My guest today is Norm Eisen. I was sure we wouldn't be talking this week because I was sure in his work as an ethics lawyer and impeachment expert that he would still be working on the second Trump impeachment and we would improvise this week. And of course, it came to such a crazy extend then cut you're here and I'm so glad, but I'm so, I'm so sad. Norm, <laughs> but welcome. A sad, but happy welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. It's very nice to be with you. My Twitter friend and fellow Brunonian. My Twitter friend. And yes, uh, I, I feel like I know you because I see you on TV all the time, but I, I want to know you better. That's why we're talking today. I'm much less interesting in real life than I am on television. I sort of pack uh, a week's worth of uh, personality into five to seven minutes on television. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That is fantastic. Well, you wouldn't be a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institute, and you wouldn't be on the Judiciary Committee, and you wouldn't have been ambassador to the Czech Republic And you wouldn't have been the czar of ethics under President Obama if you were really so flat 
and dull. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, I have not necessarily found that sparkling personalities are always conducive to career advancement here in the swamp in Washington, D.C. And as uh, Disraeli put it, climbing the greasy pole. Sometimes having a more neutral persona is useful in that regard. But unfortunately, mine is a little more a little more colorful. <laughs> well, and you probably are exhausted from all the work and the adrenaline rush of everything that happened from January 6th to now. Yeah, I'm exhausted from covering the second impeachment for CNN. Right. On, on top of my new election project, the Voter Protection Program that we'll talk about right. over, over the summer to defend the election against Donald Trump's coming attacks that were so obvious. And the past four years have been, I think we're all sort of breathing a sigh of relief and detoxing and getting into our PTSD, our post-traumatic stress from the Trump era. Last night, I was talking to my wife about coming on your podcast, and we were trading our admiration for your very, very funny preppy handbook, the official preppy handbook, mocking all those, but gently and affectionately mocking those preppy people that we read all those years ago when I was headed to Brown from uh, my family's hamburger stand in Los Angeles uh, was one of the volumes that I read. And I was telling Lindsay, my wife, well, imagine what this podcast would be like if we were on to discuss the second Trump term. And we both got such a shiver of horror just thinking what it would be like if that terrible would-be dictator had managed to take control. But happily, he didn't my play-by-play -play duties on CNN for the second impeachment are over, and here we are. So pleased to be with you. Well, I couldn't be happier. I want to talk to you about the anger that I feel towards the 43 Republicans who voted to acquit Donald Trump. I don't live in Washington. I don't have to see them. I don't bump into them at the place for coffee but you do. I mean, you probably went to law school with some of them also. <laughs> I do have some acquaintances among the 43. I think we should start in the name of putting our sunny personalities uh, <laughs> forward, best foot forward. Um, we should start with the magnificent seven Republicans who did the right thing. Right. Right. And the last impeachment, of course, I was not covering the news. You were there. I was helping make the news. And in my book, A Case for the American People, I write about a number of those superb seven. Uh, Mitt Romney, above all, who I had many conversations with, who, believe it or not, in the first impeachment, Lisa, he was the first senator to vote against a president of his own party in a presidential impeachment to convict in American history. Really? The first one in wow. our almost two and a half centuries as a country. And so he was joined by six others this time. Some of them are ones who have disappointed me so often. As my father used to say, the first time you make a fool of me, shame on you. The second time, shame on me. So mm -hmm. Senator Collins, I had become somewhat disillusioned with. She restored some of my faith. Senator Murkowski, she's a uh, wonderful patriot, very independent-minded. Mm -hmm. And then there were senators, some who, uh, like Senator Sass, who we could not persuade the last time, although he did feel Trump did wrong. He made a statement the last time. Senator Burr, He's one who visited me when I was our ambassador in the Czech Republic in Prague. A Senator Burr came on a Codell. That's when I first got to know him. Uh, he's a good man, and he did the right thing. So there's the good ones. And then, you know, there's the other 43, and there the motives are mixed. You have the truly terrible. There's about seven or eight of those, and they, they largely coincide with those who 
voted not to certify Arizona and Pennsylvania's electoral slates, which just followed Trump in that deviltry. And that's Cruz and Hawley, and there's some bad ones there. And then the rest of them are cowards. And they're either afraid of losing their jobs or they're afraid physically of the intimidation they may face or both. And so I feel more sadness than anger at that remaining residue. But I'll tell you this, it's very, very dangerous for our country. Very dangerous when you have such rot in our one of our two major political parties. And it's not just in the Senate, in the House, where well over 130, I believe, voted not to certify, and only 10 in the House voted to impeach. And out in the states where the party leaders, the GOP party leaders, are like cult followers. They've taken the Pledge of Allegiance to Trump, not to To the United States. Right. Well, it's clear that he's operating in his own universe. But here's the part that gets me. He hated doing his job. He didn't do his job. He watched TV all day and tweeted. He stole money. He had bribes. He is racist. He praised white nationalist groups, and he did really nothing for the group of people who showed up to storm the Capitol. In terms of jobs, he didn't create jobs. He didn't bring esteem to the United States. He, He tried to destroy Affordable Care Act. So what is it that they all like so much? He's not self made. We know that. You know, everything about him is a lie, to paraphrase Mary yeah. McCarthy, including the word the yeah. and, 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 you know, he's just one giant cesspool of lies. Why, for example, does a guy like Lindsey Graham, who told us very clearly, we've seen the tape many times, if you vote for Donald Trump, you're asking for trouble, become his primary toady and bootlicker? Yeah. Lindsey Graham is a puzzlement. I asked one of his senatorial peers who knows him very, very well, what happened to Lindsey Graham? Because I used to have such deep respect for him. And I was told that Lindsey Graham always needs to have a father figure. And Joe Lieberman and John McCain used to perform that function for him in the Senate, or they were like two big brothers propping right. them up. And when they both left, he gravitated towards the most powerful person in his party, Donald Trump. But what an utter failure of character, conviction, principle. And, you know, I think history will look on Graham and the rest of the Trump enablers with the most profound disgust. Well, that's sort of the best hope at this point. Will we be able to get any satisfaction from what has happened? I mean, January 6th was, and the I, I want to say we have learned, not only is Jamie Raskin a beautiful person inside, but he's a brilliant lawyer yes. on the outside. And his team was so fantastic. And it was such a beautiful... <laughs> to quote a Republican of ill repute, it was such a beautiful mosaic of our country. Yeah. The House managers, they did an outstanding job. And it was hard to believe that anyone could listen to their arguments, watch the clips, and acquit the man behind the Capitol insurrection and degradation. Yeah. You know, they were right on the law, as I often said. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes even said on television, they were right on the law. They were right on the facts. The only question was how many Republicans would have the courage to follow their oath. And I was pleasantly surprised. I was guessing six. So when they picked up that seventh Republican, I thought they exceeded expectations. Well, And that's- remember... That's they did seven times better than we did in the first impeachment. We only got one and we were quite proud of ourselves. And look at what's happened since. Mitt Romney's been censured by the Republicans of Utah. Richard Byrd's been censured by the Republicans of North Carolina. Cassidy in Louisiana. 
Why are Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley not being censored by the Senate? Why were they allowed to be part of a jury when they were part of the problem? The reason that they were allowed, I'll break it down. The reason they were allowed to be part of the jury is because in impeachment trials, unlike in the trials we have in the regular courts or using the constitutional term Article Three courts, because the judiciary is the third article of the U.S. Constitution, an impeachment trial takes place in the Senate, and it is a combination of some trial features that we're used to, and of political features that happen in the Senate. And so because it's a political trial, you know, you can have, even though they were enablers and they advanced Trump's big lie in his election, attempted election hijack, you are allowed to sit as a juror. Look, they went in, Lee Graham and Cruz went into the defense lawyers, Trump's defense lawyers, and coached them in breaks. I mean, jurors would never be allowed to do that. Yeah. It's a political proceeding. Now, the other question you ask is, why weren't they censured or punished in some way? And that's because there is an ethics committee, and the ethics committee will look at it now in the Senate. You know, the Senate is still a little bit of a place where senators are careful. You know, if they have an issue, they take it to the ethics committee. So let's see what the ethics committee does. They don't usually discipline, but boy, do they deserve it here. Cruz, Hawley, Graham. At least Graham didn't vote against these slates. Yeah. Well, okay. So you are an ethicist. And I wonder, has the world gotten more porous and squishy? It feels like we're not behaving as well as we could. We are a nation of people (laughs) who try to get away with things. Yeah. You know, the world has simultaneously gotten... (laughs) both better and worse. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 50 million Americans who believe Trump's terrible lies and who celebrate his awful behavior, who tolerate and countenance the crimes he caused through his incitement of insurrection on January 6th and for months before with his inflammatory statements that the election was stolen, total lies. (laughs) <laughs> those that part of the country is a problem but the rest of the country i thank them because i think they've stood up brilliantly in the era of trump including voting him out right but going forward do we amend the constitution do we get rid of the electoral college do we enlarge article three I, oh no is article three justice uh, yeah, Article yeah, the three court? is the court. Do we, yeah. yeah, do we enlarge the Supreme Court? I mean, there's so many questions, and it feels like not enough time in a four-year presidential <laughs> term to get all that done with COVID. Well, I think the the right Talk thing- Talk me to, down, Norm. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think the right thing to do is to kind of put one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, and to see how far we can go by patiently- Uh, walking forward. So the biggest priority, you know, Biden took office, he set a very high ethics tone. Ah, Yes, Lisa, as you know, I worked on the ethics plan for President Obama, worked with President Obama. He has a funny description of some of our ethics adventures in his autobiography. I um, think that the Biden plan, ethics plan was even better. It really does more to close the revolving door of the special interests in Washington to and from government, important new limitations there. He removes golden parachutes where people were getting special payouts to leave corporations and go into business. And he puts in very tough limits on the other side of government when you leave on what you can and cannot do. So that is all outstanding on the part of Biden. And then Biden has moved to deal with COVID, to shore up the economy. We have taken a week out of the nation's life and the Senate's life to deal with Trump. 
and the January 6th, the initial effort to deal with the January 6th insurrection. And so now we're just was announced that in the first week in March, we'll be doing some things to fix the system. The House Resolution 1, the For the People Act, fixing our broken voting system, addressing campaign finance, toughening ethics, making presidents give up their tax returns. So a lot of things that are needed. So yes, I'm very hopeful. So going forward, we have a lot of positives to look towards. And the issue of looking backwards is a whole other thing. I have to say, as much as I loathe the man, I do want him to pay some consequence for something, for his tax fraud, for his rape of my good friend, for whatever it takes, because he's a bad guy. But not having to hear his voice every day There's no pleasure like that. (laughs) That's top one, two, three, and four things that make my life better. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. That is wonderful. I agree. And, you know, it's a relief that he's not on Twitter, too. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Norm, how did you, I didn't know about the hamburger stand. Your father owned a hamburger stand in L.A.? Correct. Is it still in operation? It's a teriyaki stand now, but it's still in operation. And so going to an Eastern college and then Harvard Law School was not necessarily in the cards when you were growing up? Far from it. I was one of the only people I went to Hollywood High School in Los Angeles. And uh, my parents were both refugees, survivors in different ways of the Holocaust. My father snuck out of Europe in 1940 and somehow made his way, got the last boat from Greece. I have a picture of the ship. He took the very last one that Greece sent to the United States, and he came here on a tourist visa, and he never left, joined the army, became a citizen through serving in the military in World War II. My mother survived Auschwitz, and then my dad uh, went back and met and married her, brought her to the United States. So my parents were working people in our little family business, and I I think I might have been the only one my year. Maybe one other kid from my high school uh, went back east for college. And it was very fluky that I went to Brown, a Brown recruiter. The year before, my friend Alexis had gone to Brown from my high school. And the Brown recruiter came and I was summoned out of my high school uh I think I was in my student government class, either student government or my civics class. And I got to come see the guidance counselor. I'm like, uh oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and uh, it was a recruiter from Brown. She gave me an application. I said, okay, sure. And it was the only school that I applied to, not realizing how hard it was to get in, but I did get in. And that was how I ended up on the East Coast. And of course, my life has taken quite a few twists and turns since then. Wow, wow, wow. You know, what's interesting, you're a little young to have that survivor story, because you are. I mean, you're a first generation American. But like in my family, my father escaped Germany, Mm. but my mother was fourth generation So I think that's more typical of people in our general age range. But the fact that your mother was still in Europe after the war and survived Auschwitz, I mean, incredible. She was an amazing amazing person. I write about her a lot in my book, uh, The Last Palace, which is about my time as ambassador in Prague. And Was um, your mother Czech? She was Czech, yes. Ah. And the the house that I lived in as ambassador was the Wehrmacht headquarters in World War II when the Germans invaded. And I went back, the same German occupying forces that deported my mother and her family Mm. from Czechoslovakia to Auschwitz were in that house. And I went back and kept Shabbat, kept the house kosher, lit the Sabbath candles. Did you sage it or do something, <laughs> delouse it before you um, had your first Shabbat? Seriously, I, fumigate yes, the- I'll tell you what I did. We had for our first Shabbat meal, we lit the candles. We said the prayer over the wine, over the challah, the bread. 
And then I lifted up, we had kosher lamb chops that night, and I lifted up a lamb chop, I pointed it in the air, and I said, Hitler, take that. (laughs) <laughs> and I took a big bite out of my kosher lamb chop. And that was how I exercised the demons of the past. That house has a fascinating history. And in fact, that was the subject of my first book. Of the palace, I told, yeah. I told the yeah. story of the people who lived in that house and my mother's story, and I wove them together. Well, I'm going to read The Last Palace. because I hope that you'll sounds, enjoy it. That, that intrigues me. And I've been to Prague very briefly, but a lot of Americans are quite familiar with mm-hmm. Western Europe. And Eastern mm-hmm. Europe has a glaze of something a little bit opaque and very moody, I would say. Yeah. I was in Prague in the wintertime, and boy, was it cold. There is wonderful Mozart in Prague. There is wonderful Mozart in Prague. Yes. That's for sure. That's for sure. What a life you've had, Norm. Just before we get to your five things, could you tell me a couple of the lawsuits that we can look forward to that you are most excited about? The first one came today. Benny Thompson, a member of Congress, sued Trump and the militias, the Proud Boys and others, Giuliani, who were responsible for the insurrection, a civil rights lawsuit for their words that they knew or should have known would cause the terrible, terrible damage, the irresponsible, knowing, awful words. Trump saying fight 20 times, Giuliani saying let's have trial by combat, and Trump endorsing, praising Giuliani, and then telling the people, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. So they- And he says, let's go down Pennsylvania Avenue. So that lawsuit is on file. The first of the lawsuits has been brought and there'll be many more to come. And I think they're going to send Trump to a place that he's very familiar with, bankruptcy court. Mm. So that's the civil lawsuits. And I think we're going to see criminal lawsuits too. Cy Vance, the Manhattan DA is coming after Trump for his offenses relating to his finances and his financial records. So that will be very interesting and important. Fonnie Willis, the Georgia DA, will be coming after Trump to look at uh, solicitation of election fraud because of his call to the Georgia Secretary of State when Trump told the guy Raffensperger. Can't you find... I just want 11,780 votes. (laughs) One more than to win the election. Yeah. So, you know, you, Lisa, you can't do that. That's a very <laughs> serious case of possible solicitation of election fraud. So I think there's going to be those criminal cases, and they will introduce Trump. He's familiar with bankruptcy court, but those criminal cases could introduce Trump to a place he hasn't yet seen, and that's the pokey, the Huskow jail. The big house. The big house. Wow. I just, it's a dream. Do you think, I mean, he is Teflon. Do you think he'll finally, <laughs> he'll finally pay any price and pay I do. the piper? <clears throat> yeah, I do think that, um, well, one never knows for sure, but I think there's very plausible cases of civil liability. I think the criminal cases are very serious. He's reportedly very worried about them and he should be. Good. He should be. Yeah. We'll see you in court, Trump. Norm Eisen, such an interesting person. I wish we had more time, but let's get to your fantastic list of five things that I enjoyed reading and I know our listeners will enjoy. Number one. For me, this is a mix of things that make life better for everybody and make life better for me. That's perfect. That's what my list is like every week. (laughs) So my number one is my beautiful family, my wife and my daughter. They are such treasures. They keep me on the straight and narrow. As I wrote when we were preparing for the show, they keep me from getting a swelled head. Occasionally, I might have a small tendency in that direction. So uh, (laughs) that's excellent. And of course... You know, you just share so much history, my wife and I, for a quarter of a century. And and now to see our wonderful daughter has, Kane Nahara, has grown Mm. up and is off at college. 
for this second semester of her freshman year at Hopkins. So proud of her. So that's number one. Then number two is one for me and for everybody. And that's my 7-Eleven robotic barista. You can get the most wonderful extra large lattes at 7-Eleven. Hot or cold Whatever or you want, whatever you want, low fat milk or whole milk, dark roast, or I like the medium roast, extra large latte, two twenty nine. You cannot beat that. And you cannot beat that. And you're your own barista? Is that what you mean by the robotic <laughs> barista? You just hit a button and it does the rest. So it, it doesn't misspell screen. your name. <laughs> or can it do that too? Yeah, I suppose uh, there's no, the only names are the names of the coffees on the touch screen. So nothing can go wrong there. Wow. Perfect. So that's number two. That's and a then, very good tip for us. You're right. Number three. Well, wait one second. I'm very, I'm a very coffee-ish person. Yeah, go ahead. It's a good latte also? It's a latte. Yeah, I mean, there's... Yeah, there's 20 It's good and it's well-priced. Okay. There's 20 different options in that machine, but I take the hot latte with the medium roast. I have one every morning. There's a 7-Eleven at the end of my block here in D.C. Number three. Excellent. Also... Yeah. Moving another couple blocks away, and a wonderful thing for me, for anybody who lives in D.C. or visits D.C., we have a national park in the middle of D.C., Rock Creek Park, and it's designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. It is one of our 63 national parks. It used to be its own national park named Rock Creek Park, and then it was incorporated with other National Park Service properties into the I think it's called the National Capital Park. That includes the mall and uh, the Washington Mall and other historic sites. But Rock Creek Park sprawls from Georgetown all the way out to Maryland. And it just is a magnificent hiking, biking, walking. There's trails, there's wooded areas, there's all kinds of little tributaries There's some little paths that uh, run between Calorama, where I live, and uh, Georgetown, where I like to hike. And that is just a treat for everybody. Excellent. Number four. Going from the uh, natural to the (laughs) man-made. Or from the uh, sublime to the vain. (laughs) I, under the influence of my wife and daughter, who are very green, They're very, very eco-friendly. My daughter told me about a wonderful website, The Real Real, where you can get gently used clothes that people secondhand consignment online. Very, very beautiful things. And I've taken to buying my shirts there. You get wonderful Italian shirts for just sometimes as little as $20 or $30. So I recommend The Real Real to everybody. You help the planet. It's sustainable, and you can enjoy beautiful things. At pennies on the dollar. At pennies on the dollar, but not J.C. Pennies on the dollar. Exactly. May it rest Um, in peace. And number five. Number five is pandemic specific, and that is my KN95. I've just upgraded from the surgical masks, those rectangular ones, to a nice brand of authentic KN95s that I get on Amazon. And I got used to the little extra pressure points behind my ears and on my nose. And I'm told by a physician friend of mine that those KN95s are the way to go. And so I feel safe when I'm out and about, thanks to my, which I try not to go out and about too much, but when I must, I have my KN95s to keep me safe. Exactly. I am also very cautious And I know we'll be wearing masks for a long time. Big deal. Yeah, I think the era of maskless living is a ways away from us now. So say la vie. Say la vie. What are you going to do? Well, it's been a pleasure talking to Norm Eisen. 
And thank you. Really, thank you. There's more, <laughs> much more to plumb with you, and I hope we'll get to plumb again. Uh, my guest this week has been Norm Eisen, Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution and an expert on law ethics and anti-corruption. He served as the special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for the first impeachment and trial of President Trump. His most recent book is called A Case for the American People, the United States versus Donald J. Trump. You can follow Norm on Twitter at Norm Eisen, which is how we met. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. Our podcast has been produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Espresso Rucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. My blog is at lisabirnbach.com, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program, including a picture of a giant robot latte. We will find one, <laughs> our crack headquarters. And until next week, wear a mask or two and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. <laughs> <laughs>